My name is Joe, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, today we're in the third part of our Christmas series, talking about the gifts of Christmas, the gifts of the wise men that they gave to Jesus. We're looking at that first Christmas and who Jesus is to us through the lens of these three simple gifts that were given. This time next week, the gifts will have been given. This time next week will be Boxing Day, if you can actually get your head around that. I don't know if that's horrifying to to you, but it is to me. Where did this year go and what has happened? (laughs) But this time next week, Christmas will be done. We'll be back to normal life. But what we can take away from this time and this season and this moment can change us forever. So this morning, as we look at this third gift, I'm going to need you to interact with me a little bit. Okay, because... It's been a long week, it's been a long year, we're all a little bit tired, and I don't want you to miss what the Lord might have for you this morning by just kind of slowly sitting in my beautiful dulcet tones, lulling you into a, just a, som- just, just a slumber, just a rest. I know it can have that effect, but I want you to stay with me and stay sharp. So if you've been here uh, any time in the last few weeks, you'll know we're, we're anchoring ourselves in a passage in Matthew chapter 2. Do you remember that? Some of us, yes. Great, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to have a quick look, uh, just a kind of our anchoring passage for this series, Matthew chapter 2, verse 10 and 11 and 12. And it says, and I read, when they, the wise men, saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So, so far we've looked at frankincense. Anyone remember what frankincense is supposed to tell us about who Jesus was supposed to be? Yell it out, come on. If you're at home, yell it out to the TV. I'm sure I'll hear it here, like Blue's Clues. Yell it out. The divinity of Christ, that's right. The divinity of Jesus, that he is God come to earth. Frankincense told us that he, it reminded us of the, the, the aroma of heaven, the presence of God. And remember what gold was about. His royalty, I'm sure that's what you said. He's king, yes, Jesus came as king. Not just king of the Jews, but one day, as we sung earlier, the king of all of heaven and earth. And today we get to myrrh. Myrrh. It's a word that many children struggle to spell during our Christmas walkthrough experience as they had to write down the three gifts. Not just the children, I'm told, but also some of our host team. It's a tough word. It's a weird word. It's not a word that we use very often. But myrrh is the third gift. Now, before I jump in and explain to you what myrrh is and why it's important and why it was the third gift that was given to Jesus at his birth... Remember, as we get into Matthew's gospel, he's trying to show us that Jesus is the new and better version of everything that's come before. There's all these promises of God. There's all these these commitments that Yahweh, creator God, the God of Israel, the God of heaven and earth had made to his people, his covenant people, the people that he had invited into a relationship with him. And he'd done all this stuff and he'd been faithful and he'd demonstrated that he was real and true through right out through the the first three quarters of this book, the Bible that we have, where he shows up in power, where he saves his people with a mighty hand, it says. But Matthew wants us to know that when push came to shove, when the very best efforts of humanity, of you and me and those who came before us, when everything got to the point where it just wasn't working out, where we couldn't save ourselves, where we couldn't get ourselves out of the mess that we found ourselves in, God himself stepped in. In my mind, it's like when I'm watching my children try and undertake a slightly more complex task than they're able to do. Uh, we're, we're, getting, we're, we're packing up some stuff and moving some things around in our house and we had to take apart some Ikea shelving. Oh, no. Yes, oh no. And, uh, and I could have got the children to do it, but I thought if I do, it's going to be a disaster. So I kind of, in my heart, I thought, you guys go away, I'll do this myself. And that's the kind of feeling I have about Christmas. But God said, you guys have tried so hard, you've done really well, but it's just not working out. Everybody calm down, I'm going to come and do this myself. But no one expected God to show up as a baby. 
No one expected God to step into his creation. So, these three gifts, one for his divinity, for his godness, one for his royalty because he was a king and he would be and will be king. And myrrh. Myrrh is a little bit like frankincense. Myrrh was this kind of, this extract from a, a plant. It was like a bit of a resin, like a gum, like it didn't look like much. It had a very strong odor. It was used traditionally in things like incense, just a bit like frankincense. It was used in perfumes. It was actually so strong it was used as an antiseptic. In fact, in strong enough concentrations, it could be a painkiller. Which I thought was really interesting because myrrh doesn't show up too often in the New Testament. In fact, it really only shows up in two different spots. Where we just read in Matthew chapter 2 and then at the other end of Jesus' life. If you've got your Bible, which I hope you do, otherwise it will be on the screen, but it's always good to have a Bible. You can get it in an app on your phone. Let's go to John chapter 19. Because myrrh shows up in John 19. Verse 38, we'll start. And a lot's happened since the birth of Jesus. He's lived. He's lived an amazing life. He's done all sorts of amazing things. And then just when it seemed to be going so well, he is arrested and crucified as a criminal. And the people who followed him and thought that he was this king, that they thought he might have been God, really didn't know what to do. Then we get this moment in John chapter 19, verse 38. After these things had happened, the crucifixion, Jesus' death, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate, the Roman ruler, that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So Joseph came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, he's another follower of Jesus in secret because of the Jews, he had earlier come to Jesus by night. He came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. And so because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Myrrh shows up here. It's interesting that when the Holy Spirit inspired the, the writers of the Bible, of the gospel accounts, when he asked them and reminded them what it was they needed to record so that for us 2,000 years later we could make sense of what has happened in history, the Holy Spirit wanted us to know that Myrrh was there at his birth, was there at his death. Myrrh, as it turns out, reminds us of the humanity of Christ. It reminds us of the humanity of Jesus, that he was a human, that he was a man. And that, for me, becomes probably the most profound mystery in the scriptures. I don't know about for you, but it's a really big idea, a big thing for us to wrestle with, that Jesus was fully God and at the same time fully human. If, if you get it, amazing. If you don't, you're in good company. For about 2,000 years, the church has really wrestled with this idea. People a whole lot smarter than me have really wrestled with this idea, and they don't get it. Has anyone else ever struggled with this idea? Just me? Are there some of us? Be bold. Come on. Interactive. Who struggled with this idea? Great. Good. We're all in this together. God, God did something that didn't make sense. And so we, we try to work out. It's it's not like Jesus was just a good human who got adopted by God. He's not an adopted son, because that would mean he wasn't fully God. It's not that Jesus was like two different beings living in the same body with some kind of divine, kind of bipolar or dissociative condition. That's not what Jesus was like. That wasn't what was happening. It wasn't like that he was fully God and just kind of put on man clothes to just look like us. And wandered around and did stuff. And we're like, he looks like us, but he's not. 
It wasn't that he just decided to be God for some of these things and stopped being God for some of these things. It's quite the mystery. It's quite the struggle. And for me, this has been one of the challenges of my own Christian walk, is that this becomes what's called a faith step. That at the same time as receiving the gift that tells us that he is divine, he got a gift that told us that he was human. And Jesus, in the mystery of God's work in this world, thought that it was okay to be both at the same time. It's a step of faith. It's, a, it's an invitation to believe that maybe God is up to something. And this is what I think the writers of the gospel accounts want us to wrestle with. They want us to tease it out. They want us to not be afraid of asking the hard questions, but actually start to engage. What does this really mean? Why would you give a baby a gift that talks about a man's death? For me, here's one of the things I've worked out. Would you like to hear one of the things I've worked out? Some of you would, great. The rest of you who've got it sorted, you can come see me afterwards in the cafe or email me in if you're watching online and tell me how I've missed it or your perspective. It shows me that in the midst of all of this, God didn't just realize that his first plan failed and he had to work out a quick solution. See, we know from the story that God showed up, that he created us in his image, that he wanted to have a relationship with humanity and it all went pear shapes, terribly wrong. And it wasn't like he went, uh-oh, what do we do? It wasn't even that he got to the point of coming as Jesus and went, okay, I'm going to fix this. Uh-oh, they caught me. They're going to kill me. What do I do? For me, the fact that this happened at his birth shows me that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit had a plan all along that God will put himself in the very place for us to be prepared from birth for his very special death. So that death itself would be vanquished, so that life would overcome, so that a resurrection would happen and eternity would be available for everyone. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. Why did God need to become human? That's the other wrestle for me. Like, it, it, if, if I can step through the, the wrestle in my mind and, and let my heart start to believe that maybe Jesus could be fully God and fully human, and that was something very special, why on earth did he need to be human in the first place? Right? Did you ever think that? Have you ever wrestled with that? Anyone else? Like, as a kid sitting in church, I thought, God, couldn't you just use your special God powers and go, zap, you're all fixed and it's all right now? Right? If you've ever had to walk through trials in life, have you ever prayed, God, just, can you just zap this and fix it? No, that's just me. Anyone? <laughs> Some people. I've really wrestled with this. God, like if you made it all, if, if, if I believe the Bible to be true and you hold it all together with the, the power of your word, that all of this is your creation, why is it in such a state? Why did you need to, to leave that unseen space where you're all powerful and, and fully able to do all that you need to do? Why would you come and become a baby? Fragile and vulnerable and just able, anything could go wrong. What I've come to as I've journeyed through this wrestle, and maybe this might help you today, that if we go back to the very start, because the start is a good place for us to begin, it gives us a reference point for what's supposed to come afterwards, that God made you and me in his image. He made us to reflect what he's really like. Now for some of us, we're like, well, if this is a reflection of his image, he mustn't be a very good God, because I know what I'm like. Some of us, we look around and go, that person is clearly in the image of God. They're amazing. They're much better looking. They've got much more hair than me. But God made us in his image. 
God made us to reflect some of who he is and his heart and his character and his nature into the world around us. And, and if he just decided to make us bang, this is how you are and you have no choice and no freedom to carry who I am into this world, that doesn't really reflect the freedom and life, the love that God has for his creation. Because see, at the core of everything, God is love. And God created us in his image to love and to be love. So we're created to love. We're created to care and to support and to nurture, to sacrifice on behalf of others, to, to put others before ourselves. It's our designed state, yet it's not exactly how everything ended up. Because God didn't hardwire the world to love, but created the space for us to choose. It made love valuable. If you've ever had Christmas around kids, there's, for us in our family, well, maybe just for me, I won't project anything onto my, my amazing family. I'm a gift love language person. I, lo I love getting gifts. That's not a fishing for gifts from you. Please don't, that'd be super awkward because I also struggle to receive, but that's my own thing I'm working through. But it doesn't always feel fulfilling to me when I take the $20 out of my pocket in the shop and give it to my child to buy the present for me that he's going to give to me on Christmas Day. So I'm like, you walked in here, you asked me which one I liked, I picked it, I paid for it, you will try and wrap it and then I will receive it. It didn't feel like a choice. It didn't feel like something valuable that they went and they sought out and they gave to me. <laughs> is that just me? Or is... No, I don't want to be the Grinch. Come on, no, I love Christmas. But there's something valuable about free choice, about the opportunity to choose to love and to demonstrate love and to care. And so God didn't hardwire us to, do, by default, just love. He gave us the ability to choose. And the choice to love... And so then the choice to not love becomes the cornerstone of how this whole thing works. That's kind of what it looks like. And so if you can choose to love, you can choose to not love. And guess what we did? We chose to not love, right? I've chosen to not love. I'm sure you have too. The very first humans that were created chose not love. And decision after decision after decision on year after year after year, millennia after millennia, has brought us to this place of brokenness, of death, of decay, of knowing that there's goodness in the world but not really able to grasp a hold of it, to know that there's something better but we don't seem to be able to find our way to it. We, we find ourselves making decisions that we know aren't healthy and good but we don't seem to be able to stop it. We find people making decisions that impact us and hurt us and, and break us and everything in between. But somehow in... His divine wisdom. God knew that making our decision for us just wouldn't work out. He knew that we had to be able to make our own decision. He knew that there was a new and better way of living life. Remember I said back at the start, we've said each week in this series that Matthew particularly wants us to know the new and better way that comes with Jesus this God, human, king, saviour. That means there was an old and worse way if there's a new and better way. And for many of us, the old and worse way is where we're stuck, that's where we've been living, that's where we've been challenged with. But God took matters into his own hands and he came to us. That is the moment and the message of Christmas. God came, but came fully human so that he didn't come in a way that was unrelatable to us. He didn't want to come in a way that made no sense to us. The, the person who wrote this book of Hebrews, it's a little bit after the gospel, said that we didn't need someone who didn't understand us. We needed someone who totally understood, someone who came and who, who laughed and cried, who, who sweated, who, who shivered, who, who was sad, who, who stood up for justice, who, who told, told people what it looked like to live 
the right way. We needed someone who we could relate to, who we could connect with, who saved the abused and hurting and was challenged by the things that were going on around him. Jesus came and did that and lived the way that God had called us to live. And he did it in a way that reflected perfectly God's desired way for us as humans, as people to live. He came and did it the right way. It's challenging because we all have this thing called a conscience. Some of us have a a conscience that is very loud and proud and reminds us when we're stepping away from the things that are truly right. Some of us maybe have dulled the voice of our conscience through years of being hurt, of hurting others, of being disobedient, of, of fixing our eyes on things that aren't actually good for us. But Jesus came to show us that there is, there is a way to live that hears God's voice and responds appropriately. You can live right. He lived right and he died in the most unjust and unacceptable set of circumstances. But he died on behalf of us. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul, who was writing about Jesus and what he's done. He says this in verse 20 leading into verse 21. Because of all of this, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God actually making his appeal through us. Paul, you can just hear him crying out. We implore you on behalf of Christ Jesus. Be reconciled to God. Why? Because for our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin, the one who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, this is part of the mystery that God made a way for our brokenness, for the brokenness of our lives, for the secret and hidden and the obvious and the hard and the messy things of our life to be dealt with, to be paid for, to be resolved and reconciled. And it was all through Jesus. He lived the life we were designed to live but couldn't. He died the death that we each deserve to die but now don't have to. So that in him death could be defeated and God's way of living could be accomplished. That's what Matthew wants us to know. You see, just this one little verse that mentions these three little gifts. It's a foreshadowing all through the Bible, there's these, these little glimpses and hints. If you, if you haven't ever read the Bible with a, an eye to see the, the patterns and the, and the hidden things of God, just the, the little moments where you think, oh, that's familiar. Why is this here and then there? Then there's a richness that you can find. But, but, but the, the Bible authors want us to see this kind of this foreshadowing, that, he's, he's, that they're anticipating something that will come. So when a baby receives a gift of myrrh that speaks to death and burial, they want us to be ready to pay attention because when something happens to this baby who becomes a man, then it's going to let us know that this was the plan and this is the invitation of us. And it says in John 19, just before what we read earlier, so Pilate delivered Jesus over to the people to be crucified. And so they took Jesus and they went out And he, bearing his own cross, went to the place called the Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus in between them. In the midst of all of this first Christmas, the celebration, the angels singing, the the wise men arriving, stars in the sky, Kings being threatened, seismic shifts happening in the world that no one could understand yet. God came 
Emmanuel, God with us, he's called. The promised king. And this same king would end up dying. This is another one of those mysteries. I'm like, God, did, did it have to be this way? Did, did it have to be the, the one true perfect person that had to die? It's heartbreaking and it's confronting. But I think Christmas is so important for us as believers. If you're a believer today, Christmas is so important because it's one of two moments that we still celebrate in our calendar. And the moment of Christmas takes us to the moment of Easter. And the moment of Easter opens the door that we might be reconciled to God. That the way that we are designed to live but we can't seem to live would be opened up and we can find fresh life and new life and freedom in him. Christmas is the first bookend and Easter is the second. It comes full circle. I mentioned that you know, Mer's only spoken about a couple of times in the New Testament. One in Matthew chapter 2, uh, another time in Mark 15 at the crucifixion, and then in John 19 at Jesus' burial. But they're alluded to in another gospel story in Luke 24. And, and this is how Luke tells his other bookend. And I like Luke's version. It says, On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, as you would be, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man, Jesus, must be delivered into the hands of sinful people and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven, the disciples and to the rest. I love this moment because it's like all these people that have been walking with Jesus for so long, they heard all of this stuff, but they'd forgotten, they didn't realize, they didn't understand, and it all became crystal clear in this one moment. I mean, you, you, you've got to understand, if you're walking around with this guy who's just a bit like you, but seems to get things right, and he says, just to let you know, I am actually God, but I'm also fully human. I'm going to die, it's going to be horrible, but I'll be back. You can imagine, like, I don't really understand what he's talking about. Is this one of those parable things? Is this like seeds die and they grow and this is the cycle? I don't understand. (laughs) And then in this moment with an empty tomb, all of a sudden it crystallizes and they go, (gasps) and I kind of felt for us that, you know, these conversations about life and death and eternity and, and, and the brokenness of our lives and the freedom that we're invited to and the love of God, all that kind of stuff, in the midst of what is supposed to be, according to the people outside, just a holiday of fun and consuming and, and play and rest and cricket and pools, it can feel a bit out of place, right? It can feel like it's not the right time to talk about these things. But I wonder if maybe we're just a little bit like those disciples. That for the last 50 weeks of this year, God has been trying to get our attention. He's been showing us the things in our lives that he wants to pour his love into, that he wants to touch, that he wants to redeem, that he wants to restore. And it didn't make any sense, but we come to this moment when it is actually about Christ, Christmas, Jesus Christ, the anointed one of God, that maybe this is where it's all supposed to come together and make sense. That maybe this is the time when this year that you've just lived through is actually supposed to come together and you're supposed to realize there's a missing piece of the puzzle and it might be Jesus. Because there's lots of things to wrestle with. 
There's lots of things to understand and there's a lot to try and make sense of. But if I'm going to be honest with you, for me in my life, it's the only thing that makes sense. In the midst of everything else, it's the only thing that makes sense. Because for me, before I met Jesus, my life was marked by insecurity, by fear, by being afraid of not knowing if I belonged and if I was worth of anything at all. But then I met Jesus, and I chose to follow him. And he gave me the gift of forgiveness and love. And now I can live secure. And I can live with this peace that helps me make sense of this world. And now I don't have to be afraid anymore. And I believe that this Christmas, my story could just be like your story. That no matter what's going on, that Jesus might make your story a little bit like mine, full of peace, full of safety and security, knowing that we're worth something, that we're worthy of something. Christmas is the time when we get to be honest about how we feel about things. We'll probably be honest about how we feel about our friends and relatives after Christmas lunch. But can we be honest with God about how we really feel about things? Because that's the invitation. Can we unload on him? Can we be honest and vulnerable with him? You can have a story that looks like freedom and life. Because it's your story that he came to change. So today I want to give you the opportunity to come to him. For some of you, maybe for the very first time, maybe this whole thing has never made any sense to you before. Maybe it doesn't yet, but maybe there's something stirring in your heart. Or maybe Jesus isn't unfamiliar to you, but maybe this year has been a year that has meant that you just haven't lived life the way that you know that he's called you to live life, the gift that he's given to you to live life. So I want to give you the opportunity to receive his forgiveness, to receive what I call is the healing of our hearts. And it's simple, it's just through a simple prayer and it's a conversation with Jesus that we just come to him and we be honest. We talk about, honestly, the things that we struggle with and the things that we don't understand. And we trust and we believe that he is who he said he is. And that maybe even though we don't have all the facts with us, we can ask him to come and live in our lives. To forgive us. To let us know that we are worth something and we are valuable. And that him coming means something for us. So we're going to pray, and it's going to be just a really simple time. So we invite you just to bow your heads and ask the, the lighting guys just to dim the lights a little bit. If you're at home, I just encourage you maybe just to put aside distractions. And I don't want to make this a private thing, but I do want to remove the distractions for you. I just want to give you the opportunity to talk to Jesus. And it's a simple thing. Three things we're going to ask him about. We're going to tell him that all the other gods and kings that have been in our life, all the things that we have decided determine who we are and our worth, we're going to say we don't want them anymore and we want to make him God and king. And then we're going to thank him for forgiving us of our sins. We're going to thank him for setting us free. And we're going to make a choice to turn away from those things. We would replace those things of brokenness with his love. And I know from what I've experienced in my life and what the Bible says to us that he'll meet us here in this moment. So I'm going to pray and you can just echo it in your own heart and in your mind and if you need to put those words on your lips in a way that is meaningful to you, then that's okay. But I'm going to pray now and 
I hope you pray too. Jesus, I choose now to make you the king of my life. Jesus, I choose now to separate my life from all the other things that took the place of you as God and king. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to heal my brokenness. And as I turn away from that, I receive your new life that you have for me. Thank you, Jesus, for washing me clean. Thank you for making me new. Amen.